Hey, and welcome to our second live streaming event um, in our series, the Summer Security Foundations, that we're doing for Attack IQ Academy just for this summer. So we put together a special limited time learning path uh, for you. If you haven't registered, I recommend you go do that now because it gives you a cool special badge when you're done. Who knows? Maybe you've already completed the courses on there. But we didn't stop with just the learning path. We decided we were going to do these 30-minute sessions to kind of summarize and go over things that were on the learning path and answer some of the questions that you've had. Uh, so for those that don't know me, um, if, if you haven't taken any of the courses yet, then you, you probably don't know me. But if you have taken our courses on Acad Tech IQ Academy, you're probably familiar with me. My name is Keith Wilson. I'm the Director of Cybersecurity Education for Attack IQ, and I run our free online cybersecurity education program, Attack IQ Academy. So in this uh, session, we're going to be covering foundations of AI security. I hope you all had a chance to go through the course. It's a pretty long one. It's about four and a half, five hours long. It's by far our longest course. It's why I gave two weeks between our last session and today before we do uh, any sort of review. So we're going to do a quick sort of summary review on here. Please ask your questions in chat. I'm going to try and keep an eye on that. So let me go ahead. If you ever see me turning my head to the side like that, that's why I'm, I've got you up on this monitor where I'm looking for your questions. So if you have any questions throughout, please put them in chat. I'll try to get to them. Um, we also have questions that were submitted ahead of this session uh, that we're going to be getting to at the end. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started because I mean, we really only have 20 minutes with each other today. So before we begin our discussion on AI security at all, and this is in the course too, I think it's important though that we talk about the types of AI that exists um, in practice and in theory. And we can discuss the AI based on capabilities and types, right? And th those are overlapping. You can have uh, types of AI that, that have overlapping capabilities. Um, so there are three types of AI based on capabilities. The first is called artificial narrow intelligence or ANI, and it's specialized. It excels in specific tasks such as diagnosing diseases or predicting stock market trends. And it's limited to uh, its trained domain. It can't generalize its knowledge to other areas. So ANI, artificial narrow intelligence, the kind of the, the most basic of capabilities when it comes to artificial intelligence anyway. And there's general AI. Now, general AI is theoretical. So this isn't seen in practice. It's a concept um, to that's trying to replicate human-like intelligence and allows it to understand, learn, and apply knowledge across various domains. So it's different in AI in the fact that general AI could potentially manage diverse tasks anywhere from urban planning to scientific research without needing retraining for each new context. So AI has been trained for one thing and one thing only. If you want to do something else, you got to retrain it. General AI, again, theoretical, in theory, it should be able to do a whole wide range of tasks, right? Um, you know, let's let's take uh, we'll take putting together a course, right? Uh, so there's multiple singular tasks that go into creating the courses that we create on Attack IQ Academy. Um, there's writing, right? So uh, there's a task for writing. There's slide design. There's presentation where I get on camera and video. Then there's video production. Um, there's quality assurance. There's test writing. There's all sorts of tasks that go into a uh, creating a course. Now with A and I, just uh, this is a kind of a quick on the on the spot example that I'm giving. So A and I, we do one of those tasks. So this artificial narrow intelligence can write, right? So this helps me write a course. Okay. Now general AI can help me write a course as well, but it could also help me record that course, present that course, design the slides for the course, where the artificial narrow intelligence would need some sort of training, new training for each of those different tasks. General AI doesn't. 
Okay, and then last but not least, there's super AI, and this is also theoretical. It goes beyond general AI by possessing cognitive abilities that are superior to human beings. It can tackle global challenges, create art, and make decisions with a level of insights and creativity that surpasses human capabilities. So while AI is narrow and task-specific, general AI and super AI represent advanced and versatile forms of artificial intelligence with the potential to really reshape society and, frankly, AI security. Okay? So that gives us the three types of AI based on capabilities. Now I want to talk to you about the four types of AI based on functionality. Okay? So we're going to start with, first, reactive machine AI. So these are systems with no memory, and they're designed to perform, oops, get a little ahead of myself there. And they're designed to perform a very specific task. Okay. These systems, um, they're, they're often repetitive tasks. So you see them a lot in like industrial automation. Uh, this is where robots perform specific tasks with precision and speed that human workers just can't do. You know, if you think of like an assembly plant, if you've seen some of the automated things in, in uh, you know, vehicle manufacturing, um, you know, they could be used for welding or painting and assembling parts. These are using A&I. They have a very sort of narrow task that they're trained to do. They do this one specific thing and they do it really, really well. Okay, so that's reactive machine AI. Then there's limited memory AI. Now, limited memory AI can recall past events and outcomes and monitor specific objects or situations over time. Uh, so for this, think of autonomous vehicles. So these, uh, these use limited memory AI because they're using vast amounts of data from past driving experiences, things like road conditions or obstacles and driver behavior. They use this information to kind of make informed decisions in real time, okay? So that's limited memory AI. All right, now we're going to get back into the theoretical. So theory of mind AI falls under general AI. And if this functionality were to become real, it would understand the thoughts and emotions of other entities and would affect how the systems interact with the world around it. So in the course, I'm hoping you've taken it already, and this is just kind of a review session for you. But if you haven't, hopefully the summary gets you hooked and you want to go take the course. Um, in the course, we, we discuss this and we, we give the example of healthcare. So healthcare could see the introduction of companion robots that are capable of understanding and responding to the emotional states of patients. So not only would they be caregivers, not only would they help them physically, but they could offer off often uh, they could offer emotional support. They could act as therapists um, and look for signs of depression or anxiety or other things that a human doctor or nurse would would be looking for aside from just treating the, the illness, right? So a very interesting sort of thing. But obviously, as we get more into the theoretical, I'm sure you can theoretically start thinking of all these security things going off. I know when I, I start thinking of uh, things like this, where we're using AI for medical, all sorts of alarm bells security-wise are going off in my head. I'm sure they're going off in yours too. But that's really why I created this course, because now is the time for us to be preparing for this. Businesses are just starting to really implement more and more AI, and it's really starting to explode. So now is the time that we learn how to secure it. And then finally, there's self-aware AI. And this falls under super AI. This falls under super AI, so also theoretical. If the functionality were to be realized, it would have the ability to understand its own internal conditions and traits, along with human emotions and thoughts. It would even have its own set of emotions, needs, and beliefs. And this is really where people start to get afraid of AI, where AI, you know, you, you hear the, the sort of chilling term from, from the movies of it's become self-aware, right? Um, so the that that's where AI starts to get really scary because now you're relying on the artificial intelligence to, to apply its own moral standards, right? Um, 
So they would they would possess their own understanding of their existence, the implications for their actions. And in critical applications like autonomous driving, AI could weigh those moral implications of decision making scenarios, choosing actions that minimize harm and align with ethical guidelines. Um, you know, that's a that's a very common sort of uh, thing that we we talk about. Um, I believe in psychology, it's referred to as the trolley experiment, right? Where you have to make an ethical or moral decision. You're driving a trolley that's out of control. Um, there, the track splits and you can choose a track to go down. Either you can go down a track that is going to um, kill, you know, a, a newborn baby, or you could go down the track that is going to kill five, um, you know, five elderly uh, on their deathbed humans. Which one is the right moral choice, right? Something along those lines. I don't know the question specifically, but this is what we're now expecting AI to answer when we talk about self-aware AI, that it has its own set of moral and ethical uh, standards that it's going to make decide. So there's a whole lot of controversy around how this is applied, but self-aware self AI is still only theoretical. So no need for alarm bells just yet, but let's just understand what it is so we can start thinking about how this can be exploited. And then again, how we can secure it. Okay. So we've kind of laid part of the basis um, for the types of AI. And now we're going to quickly talk about the AI life cycle. Now, this, this isn't super, super, super important to securing AI, but I, I think it, it helps a bit, right? Um, now, if we understand when and where attacks occur during the life cycle, that's really how it's most beneficial for us as security practitioners. So let's use the example, and I give the same example in the course, of developing an AI system for predicting customer churn. Uh, and if you're not familiar with customer churn, that's just the likelihood of customers discontinuing their use of a service. Um, so we're going to use this uh, this tool that we're this theoretical tool that we're building to illustrate each stage of the AI life cycle. So at the plan and design stage, this is the first step. Um, and you, you have to define the problem you want the AI to solve in this stage. In this case, the telecommunications company wants to reduce customer churn by identifying which customers are most likely to leave their service. The next part is collect and process data. So next data is collected and prepared for training the AI, excuse me, prepared for training the AI model. Now this includes gathering the historical customer data, uh, the demographics, service usage pattern, customer service interactions, and previous churn rates. Now the data must be cleaned and formatted, which includes handling missing values, removing outliers, and ensuring the data is in a usable format for machine learning algorithms. The next phase is build and use the model. So with the data prepared, the next step is to design and develop the machine learning model. Data scientists set out, uh, excuse me, data scientists select algor algorithms that are suitable for predicting churn, such as decision trees, random forests, or neural networks. They then train the model using the prepared data, adjusting parameters and algorithms to improve accuracy. Now, after the model is developed, we get into the verify and validate stage. After it's developed, we test it using a separate set of data not seen by the model during training. This stage evaluates the model's performance, accuracy, and ability to generalize its predictions to new data. So in other words, can it take data that it was not trained on and use the information it received from the data that it was trained on to accurately to make accurate predictions right on, on any sort of new data that it's given? So metrics such as precision, recall, and area under the receiver operating characteristics curve are used to assess performance. Now, don't get too deep into these terms unless you're actually part 
of building and developing a an AI system. I wouldn't get too deep into this process. Just understand that it exists, that it has these different stages, and that there's security problems that exist within each of those. Now, once the model performs satisfactorily, it's deployed and used. Oh, and I got a little ahead of myself on that one too. So it's deployed and used. Um, and this is when we put it into production where it can start making predictions on real customer data. Now this could involve integrating the model into the customer, uh, the company's uh, customer relationship management system or their CRM um, to flag customers at high risk for churn or uh, for targeted retention campaigns, right? Then after the deployment, the model's performance is continuously monitored. So we get into the operate and monitor stage. And this is to, main sure, uh, to ensure that it remains accurate over time. It's crucial because customer behavior and market conditions can change, which can decrease the model's effectiveness. Things change over time. You can't just make the model and then assume everything's static and it's all good. Regular updates and retraining with new data may be necessary to maintain its accuracy. And something else, um, if you've taken the full course, that you'll understand about this too is in, in there are vulnerabilities that can be mitigated by regularly updating and retraining the model with new data. So there's, there's several vulnerabilities that can be mitigated by doing this as well. Um, so not only does it help with accuracy, it also helps with security. Now, the final stage involves creating a feedback loop where the outcomes of the model's predictions, such as the success of targeted retention efforts, are used to further refine and improve the model. This can involve collecting new types of data, tweaking the model based on performance, and even revisiting the problem definition if necessary. So in the example of predicting customer churn, the AI lifecycle starts with clearly defining the problem and ends with creating a system that not only identifies at-risk customers, but also adapts and improves over time. Each stage of this life cycle is crucial for ensuring the AI system meets its intended goals or remaining responsive to new information and changing its conditions. And also, this way, it helps to keep it a bit more secure as well. Now, with all of the potential um, and complexity, it's easy to understand why security is such a concern, particularly since a lot of these are just conceptual systems uh, that haven't even been built yet. This only allows us for uh, to make speculation about how to make those systems safe. Um, and I'm gonna pause here for a second to remind you, if you have questions, go ahead and put them in the comment here, in the comments here. And uh, when I see them come up, I'll uh, hopefully be able to answer them. We'll also have a spot at the end for questions too. So if you're holding your questions at the end, that's completely fine as well. Now in the course, we cover in detail some AI resources you can use to better understand the vulnerabilities of AI systems and how to counteract them. Resources like the AI RMF uh, framework, this was released by NIST, gives us guidance and consideration uh, to companies not only developing their own AI models, but also those that use the models of others. Because typically with AI, you're either developing your, your own model or you're kind of customizing your own model from an existing model, or, and this almost kind of falls in the same thing, you're using somebody else's model. So maybe you're using chat GPT, but you're using their API, right? So you're using their model for your, your program. Um, the Atlas framework, provides a matrix of potential attacker actions. It's similar to the attack framework, but it's specifically made for AI systems. OWASP provides a top 10 lists of attacks to look out for both for AI or machine learning systems in general and for LLM systems. Now, these frameworks really are the meat of the AI course. So if you haven't taken the course yet, I recommend setting aside the time to really get into these resources. Um, and I, I see you've got a, a question on there about AI and ML. Um, 
being the same. I actually, I think you submitted this question to me uh, ahead of this and we'll get to it at the end. So uh, that there is a question on there. I want you to know that I did see your question, but I've got it saved for the end. So we'll, we'll go ahead and answer it. So the framework at the core of the AI RMF consists of four main functions, uh, govern, map, measure, and manage. Now these functions are further divided into categories and subcategories which detail specific actions and outcomes to be achieved. Typically after implementing the function, uh, implementing uh, the outcomes under the govern function, users of the AI RMF would proceed with the map function followed by either measure or manage based on your needs. Now it's important to note that these functions are designed to be used and integrated and in an iterative manner. Uh, users should frequently cross-reference between the functions to ensure a comprehensive and effective risk management process. Now, the govern section in this talks about governance of AI systems and how to set the foundation for proactively identifying and manage, managing risk. The map section maps risk to business and established context for framing the risks associated with AI. Uh, the measure section discusses the quantitative and qualitative tools and methods to understand the performance of an AI risk management program. This includes continuous testing and monitoring of metrics. Uh, MITRE ATLAS, so if you haven't heard of MITRE ATLAS before, it zooms in on the threats that are discussed in the AR, AI RMF. Uh, it provides a detailed look at how bad actors can attack AI systems. Uh, and shares ways to strengthen these systems against attacks. So like the MITRE attack framework, Atlas was developed by MITRE to improve cybersecurity, uh, yet they, deserve, uh, they serve distinct areas within the security domain, where Atlas focuses on protecting artificial intelligence systems from unique threats like data tampering and tricking AI into making wrong decisions or data poisoning, things like that. Um, this gives us detailed advice on how to spot and stop attacks specifically aimed at AI technologies, uh, where attack really covers a broader range of cyber threats that can hit any organization's IT systems. Uh, it also talks about common cyber attacks, such as viruses and phishing scams, uh, and provides tips that can help any company improve its cybersecurity. So I, I'm sure if you've been following along with our, our summer series that you're aware of this because the last course we did was foundations of operationalizing MITRE attack. So I'm sure you're all attack experts now. If not, go back, take that class. No worries, it's gonna help you get that extra special badge. So let's talk about uh, OWASP real quick. So the OWASP machine learning top 10 project is a collaborative effort drawing on the expertise of industry professionals to create a comprehensive and peer reviewed guide to the top 10 security issues that practitioners should be aware of for machine learning or AI systems. Large language models or LLMs such as uh, GPT, uh, you know, we're familiar with chat GPT uh, or GPT-4, uh, Llama and Gemini, right? So these are different models or LLM models. These are AI models that excel in understanding and generating human language. Now, OWASP has put out a separate top 10 for LLM applications project, which is similar to the top 10 for machine learning projects, um, but it, it, it focuses specifically on LLM systems. Okay, so let's quickly go over how AI risks differ from traditional security risks. Just like a regular computer program, the, the risk from AI technology can affect not just one company, but many, and can even have wider effects on society. However, AI brings its own set of challenges that our current ways of managing risks don't fully cover. So things like the data used to create an AI system might not truly represent what it's supposed to, leading to biases or other issues that make the system less reliable or potentially even harmful. AI also relies a lot on data to learn and improve, often dealing with more and more complex information than standard systems. 
any changes made during the learning phase of an AI system can drastically change how an AI system behaves. We don't necessarily have that with traditional security uh, where you can influence the learning phase of, of something. Um, the information in AI can also quickly become outdated or irrelevant. Um, you know, when ChatGPT first came out, a lot of people uh, complained. I think it was, you know, the data was a year or two behind. So there were, there, you know, there. If if the system doesn't have direct access to the internet or hasn't been trained on more recent data, it really can become outdated or irrelevant very quickly. It's it's crazy how quickly the, the, this world changes and how information uh, doesn't necessarily, necessarily stay the same. Now, AI also might need updates or fixes more often to keep up with these changes in the data or its environment. AI systems can be like black boxes, making it hard to understand or replicate their decisions. There aren't well-established rules for testing AI like there are for traditional software, making it hard to prove that AI systems work as expected. And figuring out what to test in AI systems is tricky since they don't operate under the same rules as traditional software development. Now, creating AI can use a lot of computer power, which has environmental impacts. And it's difficult to foresee or understand all the possible side effects of using AI. It really is this thing where we have to try and make best guesses for the future. Okay, before I start taking some questions, uh, I want to remind you that we have uh, that we're having another live stream session next week, same time, same place, uh, to review our Foundations of Purple Teaming course. This is a fun course, um, good one. This is a purple team. The foundations of purple teaming was one that I actually didn't even write. Um, we have uh, instructor Ben Opal that teaches that course, but I will be here next week to do the learning session with that. Uh, this is all part of our limited time learning path, Summer Security Foundations on Attack IQ Academy. So again, if you want that Summer Security Foundations badge, Go hop on that learning path, get some of these done. Hop on these learning sessions if you want to learn more. Okay, so I'm going to start with some of the questions that were submitted ahead of the screen. Uh, and the first question comes from, and uh, forgive me if I butcher your name, I'm going to try my best. Um, Andaluri Raja Nagindra uh, from India. And their question is, is AI and ML security the same? This is the same one that was asked in, in chat. So, and I appreciate this question. Now, for the, the most part, AI and ML security, security are the same. Although AI is slightly different from machine learning as it aims to support this a wide range of tasks, right? So um, it, it can mimic human intelligence, where machine learning is focused on perfecting a single task by identifying patterns to achieve the de desired results. And machine learning is really just a subset of AI. So for all intents and purposes, securing it should be the same, right? So think of AI could have multiple um, types of you know, families. You have large language models. Um, maybe you have you know, some sort of EDR uh, type of uh, ML that's looking at security events. Um, maybe you have, you know, you, you have uh, automotive uh, manufacturing, um, artificial intelligence where it's programmed to do a specific task and it's not really necessarily learning anything, right? Um, so it, it really is just a subset. Securing it should be about the same. Now, OWASP put out the 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 LLM top ten uh, versus the machine learning top ten. Let's uh, they they kind of combine machine learning into AI, right? So the machine learning is really a generalized AI top ten, where the LLM is focused on security uh, vulnerabilities that are specific to LLMs. And I think they put that out just because LLMs are becoming much more and more prominent, and they they see them as a a um, you know, big uh, surface attack surface to try and 
uh, mitigate or to try and secure. Uh, so the next question is in two parts and is from uh, Raju Kumar uh, from Australia. First, why are businesses not aligned in the AI era? For example, businesses fire people and use AI bots, AGI, to do the automated task. And second, many LLM AI tools are in the market. How can business fuel the AI budget? Now, these questions aren't really about AI security, but I'm going to do my best to try and answer them. Uh, first, I would argue that businesses are aligning themselves more to AI because they see the cost savings of using a bot to automate human tasks. Now, my opinion, the current state of AI isn't really close to that yet, other than things that should probably be automated anyway. Uh, now, just recently here in America, this is a good example. McDonald's, I think it was a week or two ago, McDonald's fast food restaurant tried to roll out an AI drive through ordering bot, and it did not work out well at all. So they were trying to replace their drive-through workers with a with a AI artificial intelligence system. Didn't work out at well. I think it uh, lasted maybe a day or two, and they pulled it, scrapped the project. So that was that was gone. So you still need actual human intelligence to drive AI. So I believe you will see businesses invest in more AI-powered tools that help their employees be more efficient or do higher level work, as opposed to investing in AI tools that will replace the workers themselves. Um, it's such a charged topic for many reasons, and the politics behind it alone are enough for many companies to think twice just before going, well, we're gonna use AI to replace everybody. Uh, for your second question about getting budget for your AI and LLM tools, uh, this is just like any other sort of project where you're trying to acquire budget. You have to be solving a problem for the business. Um, oh, I just ended my slideshow there. Let me go back here. <laughs> you have to be solving a problem for the business. Um, if you can show some sort of reduction in expenses or waste of some sort that you're saving time, right? Um, or if you can show some sort of income, some sort of return on investment for the tool, then you can make a business case for the budget. But you have to start with the problem you're trying to solve first. If you're not trying to solve a problem, it's just going to look as though you're just trying to buy new tech toys instead of actually doing something for the business. So this applies to anything in business. Want to buy a new tool, align it to a problem in the business. Okay, let's take, uh, let's see. We've got another question on here from Halima Cure. And again, I apologize. I am horrible with, with names. Um, is it secure to share confidential documents on chat GPT. So um, I will say let the, the safest answer for me to say on that is to read chat GPT's privacy policy to see what they do with the data that you provide them. Um, my personal thought on chat GPT is again, being a security person, um, I am still hesitant to put my data out there, particularly since ChatGPT uh, just recently had a, a security breach. Um, that's not the point of this call, so we're not going to get too far into that. Um, I I still don't trust AI enough to put anything personal in it, um, or you know, or the the AI companies haven't haven't proven to me that they're secure enough for that. Um, so I still try to keep it to things that aren't confidential that I, I use, uh, I use sort of LLMs to help me with. I hope that, I hope that helps. Any other questions? All right. Well, I want to thank everyone for being on here. Really appreciate it. Remember AI is new. It's still fascinating. It's still growing. There's still projects out there that people are working on to help you secure AI systems. Um, and this, uh, Frank, quite frankly, this class has exploded uh, on Attack IQ Academy. It's a very, very, very popular topic. So I hope to be able to talk to you guys more about AI in the future. Uh, please reach out on, on LinkedIn if you have any additional questions. Um, and if you haven't taken the course, if you haven't joined our learning path, please go sign up for Academy. It's completely free. Academy.attackiq.com. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next week when we're talking about foundations of purple teaming.
Have a great week.